what is it called? The shell. Um, oh my goodness, the name of the type of shell is escaping. And action. Welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy. A couple of episodes back, I announced that I had a prize from Vogue Knitting Live that I was going to pick a winner for as soon as we got to 40 comments. We just about got there and I'm I'm going to let it go. So thank you to all of you who commented and the lucky winner of the random drawing was Ellen Dreschler 9905. So Ellen, if you're watching, get in contact with me either on Ravelry or Instagram at Billy Toy. I also responded to your winning comment. So if I don't hear from you by the next episode, I'll pull another winner. Before I get started in today's episode, I wanted to remind everyone that in just a couple of days, I'll be starting the Anyway Beret Knit Along. Note the beret I'm wearing. Last episode, I showed you a variety of different berets that I've knit, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we'll meet for three consecutive weeks. We'll all be knitting the same beret together, so we'll all start together and go through the various beginning steps together and we'll come back at the one week mark to compare notes and we should have all reached a certain point in the beret at that point and then the following meeting which will be the third time we'll be wrapping up and everybody should have either completed or be about to complete their berets what I found works really well in knit alongs is that most of the people who start do complete it because they feel a certain camaraderie with the other knitters. So if you're someone who maybe has a little issue with that, this would be a great place for you to be. Also, it's not a very difficult pattern. If you don't know how to do magic loop, it's fine. Um, if you're somebody who prefers to work with double pointed needles as opposed to circulars, that's fine too. There's a lot of flexibility in this. Most importantly, flexibility of the weight of yarn that you're going to use. That's really up to you. Um, and we're all going to get a very similar result regardless of the yarn that we use. So it should be interesting. I will leave a link in the show notes of where you go to register or if you're averse to looking there, just put in the comments, beret, and I will reach out to you. My only finished object this week is this gray baby sweater for my cousin Lola's baby, whose name is Gray. I just wanted to show you the difference in needle sizes, the sweater on the upper right was knit with one skein of paint box, cotton, air, and yarn on a size seven needle. The sweater on the lower left was knit with the exact same skein using a size 10 needle. The fabric is completely different. This fabric is pretty dense, not a lot of stretch. Normally I like to knit with that kind of denser fabric, a tighter weave, because I think sweaters hold up better and pill less. This is cotton, so I'm not worrying about that. But let me grab a tape measure. Okay, so you can see this little sweater is about six and a half inches wide. This sweater, which has a completely different fabric, very stretchy. I think it'll be easier to dress the baby in something that has this kind of stretchiness to it. And the width of this, and there's a lot of play with what the actual width might be. The width of this is more like seven and a half maybe even a little bit bigger, but so much give in the fabric. 
I'm so much happier with the one on the lower left. And as you can see, the yarn goes a lot further with a bigger needle. I sent my husband on a little mission. He happened to be in the neighborhood of one of the local yarn shops. I sent the sweater with him and I told him, see what they have in the way of gray buttons. They didn't have very much that would fit the buttonhole that I made, but he sent me pictures of three and together we chose these. They are, is it abalone? I think it's abalone. It's got that blue, lavender, iridescent tone. Anyway, this is the baby sophisticate sweater. I added my own little touches. I put on a little pocket. It's a functional pocket. And I put on these little elbow patches on the back to give it some extra cuteness as if it wasn't cute enough already. So there's the buttonhole. And the button fits through just perfectly. The yarn I used is I could get it to not wash out. Woo. Boy, it's kind of a bright day. Things are getting washed out, but you can see it's paint box yarns from Lovecrafts. It's 100% cotton. They have many, many colors. And I took a chance ordering the lightest shade of gray that it would be this pearl gray, which I was really happy with. Um, 20 stitches, 24 rows to four inch. And no problems. Um, it's eight ply, not particularly splitty. I was fine with it. It blocked out nicely. Uh, good stitch definition. You can really see the difference between the garter stitch and the stockinette. And I put my label inside. I put the label and the inside bottom because I thought it's a place that really won't come in contact with baby's skin. It's pretty soft, but the corners can be a little bit prickly. Maybe after it's washed a few times, it'll soften up even more. But I thought this is a safer place than in the back of the neck where it might really irritate baby. So this will be going out to you soon, Lola, out there in the desert, West Coast, US. Um, this sweater that's hanging behind me is not something that I knit recently, but I've never shown it to you. And I came across it while spring cleaning and I thought I would just show it. This is also knit with cotton. Probably a cotton very similar to a paint box, but I knit this in the 1980s. And the red, let me just bring it closer to you. The red is a flat ribbon. I don't know if you can tell that it's not the same texture as this white. Um, I remember washing it that the red started to bleed onto the white and I quickly like, you know, soaked it and rinsed out the excess pink. And I think I got it to be pretty white again. Uh, well, it's not something that I've enjoyed wearing. I think I only wore it once to do a family photo where we were all in red and white sweaters. Uh, the guys were wearing stripes and I was wearing this because the texture, the, the drape of it is not very flattering for me. It's a beautiful sweater. Maybe if I lost a whole lot of weight, it would hang nicely. I don't know if it's something that I can ever really uh, improve upon, but I just thought I'd show it to you because it is very interesting, that honeycomb stitch. There's like a slipped stitch that creates that shape. It's kind of fun to knit, as I recall.
One of the two projects that I'm currently working on is a Tyrolean sweater. Soon I'm not going to be able to call it that because there's going to be something very non-Tyrolean on the back of it. But I first started by knitting the sleeve. These are just stitch markers. So when I knit the second sleeve, I'll have some reference points. But um, here's the first sleeve with this interesting shape at the top that will form a unique shoulder construction. You might remember me saying that I often use my sleeve as a swatch. You know, I knit a portion of it and see if it's looking to be just about right gauge and right uh, density of fabric. And if I like it, then I run with it and I just adjust the number of stitches. This pattern was not written for my size, so I was going to have to change the number of stitches anyway. Um, so this was the first piece that I knit. Then I went on to doing one of the front panels. So it's going to be kind of like this. Let me stand up. So this is actually interesting because this sweater is a little bit, the sweater I'm wearing is a little bit on the short side for me. So you can see that I went, a, well, you might not be able to see in this light, but I did go a little bit darker with this one. Um, these are supposed to have more stitches going through the center in other colors, but I decided to just do the intarsia kind of a solid color block. I thought it would be easier. And then I'll go back in and either duplicate stitch or embroider something else on them. I have some ideas in mind. Anyway, this is a one, one of the fronts. And I will go to a flat lay in just a while to show you how I have been matching this up to my template that I created last time I was with you. You'll remember that I cut out this template that has roughly my measurements on it. And the good news is that when I took some of my favorite best fitting sweaters and laid it on top of this, I found that I was in the right ballpark. Now, let me show you more specifically. I've laid the sweater out, and if I put this on top of it, I think you can pretty well see that my shoulders are lining up, the shape of the armhole is kind of lining up, and my waist is very much like where I have the waist in this sweater. Um, I could even go like that because this is below my hip line. But it's almost following the right contour, give or take a little bit. And I could do the same thing with this sweater. This is another sweater that I really like the fit of. This one is a little bit on the short side for me. If I was doing it again, I would lengthen it, but it's very close to the sweater underneath it. And if I put, oh. <laughs> if I put it on top of the template, I think you can see that this too kind of is in the same zone. For me, the most important thing is the shape of the arm, the arm side. Um, so this has just about the right shape. So I'm, I'm really very happy that I made this template. I think it's useful to me. Um, here with my recent project, I know that I still have a little more work to do up here and I made this a little bit longer, which I think I'm going to be happier with. 
And if I line up the armhole, I have more length here. Um, this sweater doesn't have ribbing, so it hangs in a different way. But with this ribbing, I think I need the extra length so it can kind of be relaxed and blouse up a little bit. The reason that I have this marker here is I made a little mistake. I'm going to have to rip back and add some more plain rows before the moss stitch because there are some additional small flowers that will be embroidered in. This is how far I've progressed on the second front panel. And once I get the two front panels and I can hold them side by side and really see how much real estate I have to work with on the back, then I'll be able to really nail down the chart for the motif that I'm going to cover most of the back with. And my other project, which gets occasional love, is this Ibiza lace scarf. I keep it knotted just so it's not so unwieldy, but let me unknot it for you and show you. Uh, this is, oops. So this is the part that's already been done for a while. And I'm working on the second part that will be grafted together with the first part. And it's grown. It's grown a little bit in length since I last showed it to you. If I had my druthers, I would be a monogamous knitter. But I'm finding more and more I just can't be because... Some things I really need to be sitting in front of my computer looking at the chart. This I have written down line by line all of the instructions and I have a whole system of how I check off the rows each time I complete them. And instead of having like 10 checks for each of the repeats, I have a whole um an intricate system. First it's dots, then it's like connecting dots. And I have a whole thing. So when I come back to looking at it, I'm able to see immediately where I'm at in the pattern. But this is the thing that travels with me. So if I have a doctor's appointment, I'm sitting in the waiting room, I know I can knock out a row or two. I don't need to have my computer. I don't need to have the chart in front of me. I don't need to carry a whole big piece. It's very compact. I know I say that every time I show this to you. This is it. The cone and the knitting. And then I have my little notebook. So a very portable. And since I'm working on it a long time and I anticipate working on it a great deal longer, it's great to have something like this. I don't know what I will replace this with when I ever finish this because it's kind of in a special category being thin, lightweight, and having, you know, very uh, small amount of yarn that's going such a long way. If you have suggestions for me, of course, you know, vintage patterns, because they're knit in pieces, can fit into that category as long as I don't have to refer to a color work chart or I don't I don't know I don't even know how to describe it I just know that this is in a unique niche that little else is in and one factor is that it's taking many many months I'm working on this over a year I think about a year and a half now I was working on it when I went to Shetland and that was September, 2022. So it's a good long while and I have a long way yet to go. You know that I have a passion for movies, vintage movies, particularly black and white. Um, what came to my attention before the movie was a book. I was looking for something to read 
as an audio book. So I could be knitting while I was listening to the book. And I generally don't like to read fiction very much. I prefer nonfiction. I want to be constantly learning, not be so much entertained. But I thought I want it to be something kind of light. And I also want it to be something that's of the time period that I'm interested in, 20s, 30s, 40s, and something of some literary significance. And there are a lot of those books out there, but the one that I stumbled upon first was a Pulitzer Prize winning book by Edna Ferber called So Big, as in how big is baby? How big is, how big is baby? So big. Didn't they used to do that with you when you were a kid? They did it with me. In fact, they did worse. How ugly is Billy? So ugly. I think that was meant to deflate my maybe inflated self-esteem as a child. I, I'm not sure, but here I am. So I didn't know what the book was about. I didn't know that it was about a child who was nicknamed so big because his mother used to play that game with him. But I began to see that it was about a woman who was really a tour de force. She lost her mother early and her father also pretty young and ended up a little bit disenfranchised, became the wife of a farmer. And when he died, she had to take on the responsibilities of the farm. And I think for its time, this character was a very progressive character. She was very strong-willed as a woman, as are some of the lesser characters in the book who are female. They're all really interesting character studies. So I could say I highly recommend the book. It's lovely to listen to if you get the the same narrator who I had. She does all the different accents of people and men's voices and the young people and the older people really, really well. But I wanted to add a little something about Edna Ferber because she was a member of the Algonquin Round Table. who live in New York or who have visited here may have passed by the Algonquin Hotel. It's in the theater district. It's on 44th Street. There were a group of celebrated writers who would meet, I think it was in the lobby, not in the dining room there. And they, they would have these weekly meetings. You know, let me pause and see if I can get more info about them. Um, so here's a little something about the Algonquin Roundtable. In June 1919, the Algonquin Hotel became the site of daily meetings of a group of journalists, authors, publicists, and actors who gathered to exchange balmo over lunch in the main dining room. The group met almost daily for the better part of 10 years. Also known as the Vicious Circle, some of its core members included Haywood Brun, Mark Connolly, Jane Grant, Harpo Marx, Robert Benchley, George S. Kaufman, Dorothy Parker, and Edna Ferber. Amongst many others, Ferber was one of the most successful writers of the group because she had won the Pulitzer Prize in 1924 for So Big. It wasn't her only book that was adapted into a movie. In fact, this book was adapted into not one, but two films. The 1932 version starred Barbara Stanwyck as Selena Peek DeYoung and Betty Davis as Dallas O'Mara. There are lots of other actors less well known to us. Um, and then the 1953 version starred Jane Wyman, who had been married to Ronald Reagan before he was president, before he married Nancy Reagan. Before I tell you who 
said this famous quote. Let me just read it to you. When I was growing up, I had three wishes. I wanted to be a Lindbergh type hero, learn Chinese, and become a member of the Algonquin Round Table. On second thought, I'm not going to tell you who said that. I'm going to let you guess. You'll never guess unless you look it up, cheaters. But if you want to make a guess, put it in the comments below. Who said that quote? That's a good one. Just to remind you, be on the lookout for an upcoming episode where I will talk about the Oscars, my favorite television night of the year, celebrating movies of the past year. And for me, it's all about the fashion. So don't miss that one. That's all I've got for you this week, but I will be back together with you soon. I hope you're enjoying your knitting. I hope you're enjoying the change in weather. It's starting to get a little warmer here in New York. And I look forward to seeing you perhaps in the knit along. Toodaloo, everyone. Take care.